What's up guys, Dogpolk here and welcome back for another episode of Poker Hands. And today we're going to be taking a look at a hand that a lot of people have been talking about from Live at the Bike. The reason this hand is so interesting is it's a classic nuts versus second nuts type scenario with both players quite deep stacked. And on that note, let's go ahead and jump into the action. Oh, I, need a break. I got a bad feeling about today, man. <laughs> Bad feeling. What does he want to do? 300? Yeah. <laughs> Andy raised and hijacked. Queen 10 of diamonds. Can me all day. I, I like think it. Garrett called. Our hand begins at 50 50 100, and the action folds to Andy, who looks down in the hijack at Queen 10 suited. And he does decide to come in for a very standard raise to $300. And the action folds around the table to Garrett, who looks down at 10 7. I think facing a full 3x raise, you would probably prefer to let this one go most of the time, especially at lower stakes where rake would be a considerable factor. You have to think about that when you're playing 1 2 or 2 5 at the casino, you're not getting the same odds to call as people in higher stakes games where the rake might be non existent. Now, you might think that's a bad thing for you, the casino is taking a lot of your money. But actually, anyway, moving on, Garrett does decide to call and let's take a flop. I, I like think it. Garrett called. Oh. Check. Garrett cards. Sure. Garrett in the third blind. Andy C bets. Oh. Garrett's got 10 7. The flop comes 9 8 deuce rainbow, giving Andy a gut shot to the nuts and Garrett an open ender. But if he hits the top end of his straight, it will be to the second best hand. You can see the importance here of drawing to the nuts in certain situations, although I think in this spot specifically, it's not nearly as bad. Let's say you had 6, 7, 8 players in the pot, you'd have to be much more worried about this type of scenario with a hand like 10 7. Certainly something to be aware of when you're playing a big pot. Anyway, Garrett does decide to check over to Andy. Andy has a straight draw to the nuts as well as a backdoor flush draw. I think betting is the superior play here, but I wouldn't mind seeing Andy work in some checks from time to time. By once in a while checking back hands like Queen 10 or Queen Jack here, we can actually hit straights on turns where our opponent won't think that's too likely, and it gives us some nice bluff candidates on later to streets. Anyway, Andy does decide to go ahead and bet $300. Now the action's over to Garrett. With 10 7 here, you're going to want to use a mixed strategy of doing a good amount of calling and a good amount of raising. Both those options are quite good here with your open ended straight draw. On a board like this, you can't get too carried away because the value range you're representing is really just a few two pairs like 9 8 or possibly 9 deuce or 8 deuce suited, as well as some of the sets. But at the end of the day, it's not a huge number of combinations, so you can't get too crazy with raising. However, your best candidates to raise are hands like Jack 10, 10, 7, 7, 6. These hands that don't have showdown value but can improve to very strong hands and get a lot of value from folding your opponent out of the pot. Anyway, Garrett does decide to play it slow and let's take a turn. Garrett has open ended. Andy has a gut shot. Oh my gosh. Straight over straight. 475. Clear chips, please. Thank you. Ten seconds. The turn comes the Jack of Diamonds, and have I mentioned that upswing poker is a great place to learn how to play cash games? I don't think I have. 
If you're a small to mid stakes player looking to up your game, I'd recommend heading over and checking out the Upswing Poker Lab. The lab has a few hundred hours of targeted content for you to learn from, from a very small team of hand selected pros. So if you're looking to try and up your poker game, I'd recommend checking it out. Anyway, back to the hand, Garrett now has the second nut straight, but is still behind against Andy's nut straight. This is the absolute disaster scenario when you play poker. You're gonna lose a lot of money in these spots. The question is, how much are you gonna lose? Garrett checks again once over to Andy, and now Andy decides to go with a fairly small bet here of just one third pot. And I kind of like what Andy is doing. He's giving himself room to be able to value bet when he has over pairs or maybe even a turn jack for three streets, and then also put his really strong hands into the size so that if his opponent tries to get a little feisty and check raises him, well, he's gonna have very strong hands like Queen 10 in there as well. I do think this is a turn it makes sense to have a couple of different bet sizes and a very large one can make a lot of sense here as well. Remember, there are a lot of hands your opponent can have that are simply going to call the turn. If he has a pair plus a 10, he's going to have to call. If he turned a jack, he's most likely going to have to call as well. And then, of course, he has some two pairs and occasionally some kind of backdoor flush draw hand. There are plenty of hands you can get value from with a very large bet here on the turn. And then it gives you more opportunity to bluff because your opponent is getting worse odds to call. Anyway, over to Garrett, I think now with the straight, you want to go with the classic golden rule here on this channel, which is when you have a good hand, you mainly want to raise. And the reason is simple. You want to build the pot to try and get more value from your opponent because you're certainly ahead of their range, even if Garrett isn't ahead in this exact scenario. But I can think of a pretty good reason to not raise here. And it all goes back to what Garrett said before the flop. I got a bad feeling about today. <laughs> Bad feeling. That's right, before this very hand was dealt, Garrett knew that it was going to be a bad day. And when you know it's going to be a bad day, you've got to approach poker differently. That means sometimes just getting out of the way early with your pocket jacks. Or when you have aces, make sure to go all in to prevent the table from being able to suck it on you. These are important tactics advanced players use, and you need to be willing to put them into your own game. Garrett does decide to raise the other $2,500, and he can have a variety of hands here that make sense to raise. Of course, he can have both queen 10 and 10 seven, and he should have more queen tens in his range preflop than 10 seven offsuits, as well as some two pair hands and then some bluffs. Maybe some kind of hand like if he floated king 10 backdoor flush draw could be a nice bluffing hand where he has good equity but bad showdown value maybe some backdoor diamonds hands there are a few different candidates here that could make a lot of sense in fact i wouldn't hate seeing him turn a hand like 10 8 into a bluff here every now and then as well the idea is that on this turn garrett can have many strong hands he's facing a small size and so he needs to work in some value bets as well as some bluffs 10 7 of course fits the bill for a value raise Back over to Andy, he's got the dream spot of you have the nuts with the backdoor flush draw and your opponent is raising. I think there are a couple valid options here. Now, Andy is certainly going to want to continue most of his range by calling. And the reason is simple. Garrett is saying he has either a very strong hand or maybe some type of semi-bluff. And so normally you want to be calling against that range to be able to keep the bluffs in to play the river. You also have positions that's going to be advantageous for you. And by calling to play another street, you're going to be able to categorize your range very efficiently. However, it could make sense for Andy to develop a bet three bet range. And the best hands to do that with are, of course, queen 10 as the value bet, and then a few selected bluffs. I wouldn't mind seeing maybe a hand like king, queen of diamonds as one of the bluffs could make sense to bet three bet, where if your opponent does have queen 10, you have a lot of equity. Uh, and also in that situation, you have a queen, so it's a little bit less likely they do have queen 10. Some other hands you might want to consider in that range would be a hand like, let's say, pocket queens or pocket tens, something that very hard blocks the hands your opponent is saying they have. So you could bet three bet with hands like this, maybe a few of your other queen tens, and then you could also bet three bet with some draw type hands to give up the river, as well as bet three bet some hands like tens or queens that block straights that allow you to bluff the river. And this is how we construct these ranges. We try and put some of the uh, semi-bluff hands to give up on later streets, as well as some hands with the optimal removal that we're going to be firing off with. Anyway, Andy does decide to go ahead and 3-bet and makes it 7,900 to go. I don't mind this size all in all. I do think that this makes some sense. Now back over to Garrett with his straight. Now when he check raises the turn, he can certainly have queen 10. He can certainly have 10-7. He can also probably have some two pairs given the size that Andy chose to use. So I do think it makes sense for uh, Garrett in this situation to fold the vast majority of his draws unless they're very strong and then continue with his two pairs of straights and maybe once in a while the occasional set. 
It is important to note here, however, that Andy is not getting a very good price on this raise. He's risking 7,800 to win uh, what's approximately 3,000 on the turn and what was something in the city of 1,200 preflop. He's not actually getting very good odds here. And an important poker concept is when your opponent is risking a lot to win a little, you don't actually have to continue with a super huge number of hands. So because of that, it actually might be okay for Garrett to look to let go of some of his hands like two pair uh, and just continue with these straight sets and maybe occasional strong draw. Uh, however, it depends on the way he's going to categorize it or, or the way he's going to structure his turn check raise range. All in all, it's important to be aware you can fold a lot facing big raises. Anyway, Garrett does decide to make the call and let's take the river. And there's a brick. Check. I don't like my hand very much, Magic. <laughs> it's a good hand, for sure, and I don't fucking like it at all. 14-5. Disappointing. What bad timing, huh? You poor I'm sure Andy feels bad, but he doesn't know, like, I'm not in the best mood and some <laughs> non-poker things, like, you know. Andy, you feel bad about it, at least, right? I think, it's, I think he seconds. feels bad. If, if he maybe cooler than me here, I bet you he feels bad about it. The river is an offsuit five, so Garrett is not going to get bailed out here by something crazy happening like the board pairing or the backdoor flush getting in, something that can really give him a good chance to fold. He doesn't have that here. He has the absolute second nuts. The only hand that beats him is queen 10. Now, Garrett does decide to check it over to Andy, who decides to go for a very healthy sized bet here on the river, 14,000, looking to get a lot of value. And I do think it makes sense to use a big size here on the river. You are saying that you have essentially queen 10 or some kind of bluff. And when you're representing that sort of range, you want to make sure that you're using a, a larger size to try and get the most bluffs into your range you possibly can. Back over to Garrett, and I can already see how this aligns with a lot of the past videos that we've done. Garrett has a second nuts, but this is a lot of big blinds. It's a little different than some of the other hands that we've had here. This is a 140 big blind ripper bet, which is certainly sizable. I know in this channel, I mainly advocate for you to not be scared and sometimes you have to lose a lot of money. In fact, so much so that when I found this hand over on the two plus two forums, one of the posters actually said, incoming video by Doug Polk telling us it's a bad fold. That hurts simple, Rick. You know, there's a lot more nuance in poker into my strategy than simply, you've got a very good hand so don't fold. And it upsets me that someone would think it's that simple. But it was also probably a bad fold. This really comes down to the way Garrett's check raising the turn and also the amount of hands like 10-7 offsuit he's defending preflop. Uh, certainly in this situation, facing that turn three bet, he's gonna be able to fold something like two thirds of his hands or 60% of his hands. And then on the river, he's gonna be able to fold another 45% of his hands. So when you think about this, what total amount of Garrett's hands does he need to call on the turn and then also call the river? It's probably something in the vicinity of 20, 25% of all of his hands. Now, if he doesn't have 10-7 very often here, it could maybe be okay to fold it every now and then, but it's unlikely to me that that's the case, given that he can certainly have some bluff raises on the turn, as well as a bunch of two pairs and maybe once in a while some type of slow, slow played set. So because of all of those things, I think 10-7 is probably a hand that you're going to have to call. And additionally, it's also a little bit important to note that he does not have a diamond in his hand, which could be a potential hand that Garrett would choose to turn into a bluff, something that uh, had the backdoor flush draw, they decided to bet through bet the turn, and maybe he just thought his opponent would fold the river if he fired again. So all in all, second nuts, probably just pay it off. I'll see you guys again next week. Imagine if I put this money in and my hand's better than his. I'm gonna look like such a jackass. And like he has a really good hand that like, you know, isn't as good as mine. I'll feel like such an asshole. I was trying so hard to empathize. Yeah, Wait, but, or if he's bluffing, either way. Just anything but him showing me a really, really good hand, you know, and then, huh. It's 
interesting. It's an interesting situation. I don't know. I might just do something crazy. I might just like not put any more money in with this fucking hand. I'll have to think about it a, a little bit more. I'll decide within the next minute, guys. Sorry about that. What do I owe? Two of these? You're going to. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll, I'll prepay you. Prepay. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> within a minute, guys. Sorry. This is disappointing. This is a disappointing situation we have here. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? I think, actually, now I'm thinking about just putting no more money in. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing to do. I haven't been doing this in a while where I sit and talk out loud, but I'm already kind of going through it <laughs> away from poker a bit right now. So I'm just vomiting it out during the hand, you know. It's fine, right? I think it's okay. It's your time. You can do whatever yeah, you want. Yeah, I can do whatever I want. Uh, God. Good show too, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his time to show. I think so. I think I'm just going to put no more money in. This hand is so incredibly, outrageously motherfucking strong. Like, Ten seconds. Yeah, fold it. All right, yeah, sure. Yeah. Huh. I like how Andy just has no money. Holy cow. Yeah. Garrett Adelstein. Yeah. Thanks for joining us here today for Poker Hands. I've actually got a lot of content coming up in the near future here because I don't want to have to jump out of a plane. So it's not going to be next week we see a video. In fact, we'll have one coming up very soon. Stay tuned and make sure to turn on notifications. See you guys then.